So far in this series on tree cutting, we have dealt with techniques where the main danger is simply mishandling of your chainsaw. When it comes to leaners, we are dealing with a tree that can be very dangerous just due to the cutting sequence. A leaner is defined as any tree that does not have its weight centered on its stump. Leaners may be further categorized based on the amount of lean they have and on how the lean is oriented relative to the direction we want the tree to fall. While there are no established ranges for the classifications, this illustration shows nomenclatures for leans along the line of the desired direction of fall. Depending on the amount of lean, some very different techniques may need to be used for felling. For back leaners, anything but a mild lean will require rigging to pull the tree in the desired direction of fall. We will discuss back leaners in the next video in this series. A tree may have a lean component either to the side or in line with the direction of fall, or it may simultaneously have both components. As mentioned in the introduction, Cutting down leaners can be extremely dangerous. A key point to remember is that while a narrow hinge will easily bend and fail as desired, a hinge that is too thick or incomplete will not bend and is likely to lead to a shear failure up the trunk. In this illustration, our feller has already made a notch and is in the process of making the back cut when disaster strikes. The tree has a significant bending moment due to the lean. The stump attempts to counter the overturning moment by pulling down strongly on the left side of the unfinished hinge. Above the back cut, fibers running up into the trunk just to the right of the progressing back cut are being pulled strongly down, while fibers just to the left of that are being pulled strongly up. When the forces are great enough, they may overcome the shear strength between the fibers and a split may develop. That split can move very quickly up the trunk. If the bending moment is initially high and the wood is somewhat brittle, the crack can run 20 feet up the tree in as little as half a second. If the tree is more elastic and the bending moment is less, the crack may move just several feet a second and reach the point where additional cracking is driven by the stresses generated by the fall of the tree rather than the initial stresses. Freed from its connection to the right side of the trunk, the left side will spring free. As with the speed of the split, the movement of the left half of the trunk can vary from walking speed to as fast as the swing of a baseball bat. A feller standing with any vital organs behind the trunk could be killed by a fast, powerful swinging back of that portion of the trunk. Here we have an example of a leaning northern red oak. It's leaning at right about 8 degrees and that's probably not that much of a lean. However, we do have to consider other factors rather than just what the trunk is doing. What we see is that on this side there is a broad open field that normally gets a lot of good sunlight, but on the other side we get into deep dark forest. As a consequence, this tree has grown with almost all of its branches facing towards the sunlight. You can see there is essentially none that are growing back into the shade. As a consequence, all of these branches leaning to the outside significantly affect the center of gravity of the tree and make it into much more of a leaner weight-wise than just the lean of the trunk would tend to indicate. Now that could have been a lot worse, but now you see the problem that this leaves us with. We've got all this weight of tree above where we need to work, and it becomes a dangerous thing trying to decide how to do it, because this 
is very highly sprung and it's going to want to swing back up. So the cutting sequence for this is going to be very tricky. Uh, what I'm going to do is cut off pieces of it so that there's nothing to slap back up against it and then I'll nibble in from the sides on this. Now that the tree is down it's easier to see that all of the branches are really on the side that was facing the sun. There's essentially nothing coming off the top of this tree. As the split travels up the trunk, it tends to migrate towards the portion experiencing the bending. In our example, that means the split will move to the right, thinning the portion still connected to the stump. What happens next will vary with the springiness of the tree and the amount of initial lean. In some weak, springy trees, the split may not move too far to the bending side and everything may simply come to rest once the crown is on the ground. This leaves a very dangerous situation that we'll discuss in a future video. The other possibility is that the thinned connection will rupture and the upper trunk will fall. Note that the left end of the butt is now extending several feet past where the feller was standing. If the connection ruptures, the trunk is very likely to fall. Hopefully the feller has already left the vicinity at a high rate of speed. The portion of the trunk connected to the stump was being powerfully bent and wants to spring back to the left. If it does so when the connection ruptures, it may kick the falling portion several feet sideways. The reasons are shrouded in history, but lumberjacks dubbed the portion of the tree that remained a barber chair. So, for those of you who are wondering how to avoid a barber chair incident, how should you plan your cuts for that dangerous leaner? The key is to plan your cutting sequence to get the hinge to the desired thinness before the tree can begin to fall. Start the sequence by making one of the two notch cuts, but not this way. The underside of the tree is under a great deal of pressure and your blade could easily get pinched and held to weight extraction with another saw. The first measure to avoid such a pinch is to make your first cut steeply inclined. The thin wedge of wood on the outside of your saw can't squeeze your blade too tightly. If it does grab it, a plastic wedge can usually be driven just above the teeth to pry the cut open enough to free your saw. The second measure is to not try to make the notch very deep. If it is important to prevent the tree from falling sideways, you will have to make the notch deep enough to get a fairly wide hinge. Otherwise, you can limit the depth of the notch to perhaps one-sixth the diameter of the trunk. The next step is to begin the back cut. However, rather than starting at the back of the tree, the cut needs to start close to the final line of the back of the hinge. The way to do this is with a plunge cut, which is made by essentially pushing the saw lengthwise through the middle of the tree. However, care must be used in starting such a cut. The chain at the tip is moving perpendicular to the length of the saw, and if the tip makes contact, the blade will be thrown in the direction opposite the chain's movement. Fortunately, though it is alarming, this mistake seldom kicks the blade enough for it to contact the feller. That, of course, is a very bad thing when it does happen. The proper way to start a plunge is to make contact with the tree at about a 45 degree angle using the returning or pulling part of the chain. Once a slot has been made that is deep enough to cover the curved end of the blade, the angle of attack can be switched to perpendicular and the plunge cut can be advanced through the trunk. Ideally, the plunge cut should be kept about an inch away from the final hinge location.
When the saw emerges on the far side, the position of the plunge cut can be compared to the location of the notch to determine how much cutting is needed to finish the hinge. If the tree is still well supported, you can lean under the trunk to look at the far side. However, if the support looks at all suspect, the saw should be removed from the plunge cut and the distance should be assessed by feel, reaching under the lean. Once the assessment has been made, finish the hinge. With the hinge established, the back cut is progressed in the opposite direction. The uncut portion is commonly referred to as the strap or the trigger. The tension in the strap will be all that is preventing the tree from falling. At some point the strap will become so thin that it will fail almost instantaneously without warning. Fellers should approach that final cutting cautiously, reaching to make the cut and being prepared to jump clear. In some cases, the tree may be of a small diameter, but still large enough for a barber chair reaction to be a safety concern. If the middle of the saw blade is such that either the strap or the hinge will be at risk when the plunge cut is made, the problem can be addressed by making a tilted back cut. Let's turn to the least dangerous situation, mild leaners. In general, these trees can be safely felled with a normal notch and back cut. However, the size of the tree should be taken into consideration before making that decision. The larger the tree is, the greater the stress in the tree will be as the cuts are made. This means that a more cautious approach may be warranted for a large tree than for a small tree. The size is also significant to how quickly the back cut can be progressed to reach the final thickness of the hinge. With a large tree, once the tree begins to move, there may just simply be too much more cutting to do on the back cut before you can get to the hinge. With a medium to small tree, it will be fairly easy to simply continue sawing quickly to complete the hinge before the tree's lean can cause enough shear stress to split the trunk. If the cutting is stopped or is too slow, the tree may barber chair. To close out the information on the danger of leaners, there are several potential defects in the structure of the trunk that could increase their susceptibility to splitting. Unfortunately, these may not be visible until after the tree is cut down. Weaknesses may be present due to insect attack or rot. Sometimes such damage can easily be seen in the trunk. Look for old wounds higher up the trunk, as they may have permitted regular entry of water into a cavity, allowing rot to progress down into the trunk behind a healthy facade. Another phenomenon is what is called a shook tree. Wind shakes, as defined by the World English Dictionary, are cracks between the annual rings in wood caused by strong winds bending the tree trunk. Unfortunately, there is no outer clue that such shakes may exist, though they are more likely in conifers. Less common are trunk cracks. These are radial cracks that are significantly deeper than the more familiar frost cracks that only split the bark and some of the cambium. I recently found a trunk crack in a northern red oak. The crack had no discernible surface expression, but extended from the center to just under the bark on the southwest side of the tree. The crack extended from the ground to a height of about four feet. While the crack had some discoloration, there was no rot. To summarize leaners, they can be very dangerous, mm -hmm. but if proper techniques are followed, they can be handled by most competent woodsmen. The same is not true of back leaners, which can require much more than just a chainsaw, particularly as the size and amount of lean increase. The issues involved will be covered in the next video in this series, Back Leaners.